LIGO is a big surveying instrument that surveys a circle of space that's four kilometers in radius. And so we mark off two directions of that space uh, that are perpendicular to each other uh, with these long vacuum tubes through which we conduct laser beams that measure uh, the distances between mirrors at the center of that circle and at the edge, uh, 90 degrees apart, and we look for a small difference between those two, which would be the signature of a gravitational wave passing through this region. To date, uh, there is no reliable uh, announcement of gravitational wave detection. So we are looking to make the first discovery of this phenomenon. We uh, have good indirect evidence uh, that it goes on because we can observe the energy loss carried away uh, by gravitational waves in the orbits of neutron stars, uh, a few of which are detectable from Earth as radio pulsars. When we were uh, looking for the multiple sites for LIGO, we had confidence that eventually a LIGO-like facility would be built in Europe, and uh, there is a three-kilometer facility there called Virgo. And uh, then we wanted two uh, facilities in the U.S. Uh, that could operate in tandem, and uh, the other facility was built in LIGO uh, Livingston, uh, and so that's in Livingston Parish, Louisiana, about a 40-minute drive outside of Baton Rouge. And uh, if you make the line between this site and the Baton Rouge site, what you would like is for that line, uh, for a great circle between the two sites, uh, to fall pretty close to our arms. So this X arm projected back uh, goes pretty close to Louisiana. And then if you took the baseline between Louisiana and uh, Hanford, uh, the bisector of that line is within six degrees of the Virgo site in Europe. And so that's a pretty optimal uh, set of locations. Initial LIGO was planned to be the pathfinder. Uh, it was a tremendous scale up uh, by roughly a hundred in length uh, from uh, any uh, you know, university based detector at the time. And uh, it would be both the pathfinder but good enough with, you know, sort of the culmination of 20th century technology, we thought that you might get lucky with it. So, you know, it's basically the get in the ballpark uh, detector, but no guarantee of any hits or runs. Uh, but it would teach us what we needed to know to design a follow-on detector that would need significant uh, uh, advancements of technologies that had to be very, very targeted for what we found in operation. And uh, it was successful in doing that so that uh, by 2008 uh, we had funding for the advanced LIGO detector, uh, which has now uh, just started its uh, first observing run. We're in the corner station. We're really right at the vertex where the two four kilometer long arms meet. Uh, the, the, it's also the place where the laser originates. So back in this bay here, we have uh, what we call a pre-stabilized laser. It's a one micron uh, laser, so the, the light is uh, infrared. You don't have a blink response to it, so that's why we're wearing these safety goggles. And that light is injected into the vacuum envelope uh, about, I don't know, 40 meters back this way. And uh, the light then travels towards the beam splitter, which is a suspended optic in this first uh, tall chamber that you see here. The, the beam splitter is suspended at 45 degrees and transmits half the light down one four kilometer long arm and reflects half the light up this other four kilometer long arm. If a gravitational wave passes, it uh, squeezes the space between the, the optics. It expands and contracts the arms effectively. And so we read that out as a, a change in the relative length of the arms. It's a very tiny effect. We expect that a gravitational wave will only modify uh, the length of the arms uh, at the level of 10 to the minus 18 meters or so, 10 to the minus 19 meters potentially. So it's a very tiny change 
Uh, and you can register this, though, uh, at, at, by sampling the, the relative lengths of the arms with the laser light that's injected into the arms. The light couples back at the beam splitter, and then uh, if there's a signal, it's read out at the output port of the interferometer, which is back in this other bay. Uh, there are photodiodes inside the vacuum envelope, two in-vacuum DC photodiodes that see that light that's returning from the two arms, the combination of the light from the two arms. And if the arms are uh, change their lengths, uh, their differential lengths, uh, for any reason, whether it's a gravitational wave or it's some noise source, then that should be read out on the, those DC photodiodes. So the changing light level on those photodiodes tells you about the change in the length of the arms. And ultimately, we think it will tell you about the waveform of some astrophysical source in gravitational waves. This is where the beam tube begins. Uh, so you see this uh, termination slab and an anchor and a big gate valve, a four-foot gate valve, which can separate the beam tube, which we never bring up to air after baking it out. We don't want to repeat that process. So the gate valves can close and we can work in the corner station and then uh, once that corner is all pumped down, we can go ahead and lift that gate valve and expose the arms to the laser light from the corner. The beam splitter is suspended in this tall chamber here under seismic isolation. There's a, a system that decouples that mirror from the ground. Sort of the two things you want to do in LIGO are one, make the laser very pure in color, and two, make the optics very still. So that beam splitter is set on a seismic isolation table, which is both passively isolating it from the ground by being suspended on flexures, and it's suspended from another table, which is suspended on flexures, and the whole system is actively controlled uh, with onboard seismometers and controls that suppress the motion of the table, so it's very, very still. And then suspended from that table is another series of pendula that ultimately hold up the beam splitter, and the net result is that that optic is very, very still. And then right next to that optic, in the second tall chamber, is what we call the input, one of the input mirrors, input test masses. And that mirror and the end mirror, its counterpart, four kilometers down the beam tube, uh, comprise the arm of this portion of the interferometer. And so light passes from the beam splitter through the input mirror down to the end mirror and actually resonates hundreds of times in the arms. And the power in advanced LIGO in that arm will build to nearly a megawatt, something like 800 kilowatts, when we're at full design sensitivity and using all of the laser power. Uh, right now, we're only using uh, about 24 watts uh, injected into the interferometer, whereas in, when we're at our design sensitivity, we'll inject 200 watts into the, into the interferometer. And so that mirror then defines this fabric pro cavity in which the light resonates and is stored to build the effect of the gravitational wave signal. And then the light is read out by comparing uh, the other arm to this arm at the output port. And that's where the signature for a gravitational wave is read out at the output stage of the interferometer. If our design sensitivity uh, is a reach out into space of about 200 megaparsecs, for the coalescence of binary neutron stars, we're right now at uh, a reach of about 75 megaparsecs on each detector. So we're about a third of the way there. And that means that we've now uh, began our first science run, or our O1 observation run, it's called, in which for three months we'll take data and accumulate uh, double coincidences, uh, stretches of lock of both our instrument and the Livingston instrument, and then analysts from the LIGO scientific collaboration uh, all over the world will analyze the data and search for gravitational waves.